I'm Phil Schneider. Uh, I spent 17 years in black budget programs. Um, government geologist, as engineer, structural engineer with aerospace applications. Uh, Self-taught metallurgist became uh, uh, kind of famous in my own right. Um, I basically uh, would have a set of notes here, but they're unavailable <laughs> in all this melee. Up here I have different artifacts uh, explaining uh, some of them are alien metals that have been produced both on this planet and the confines of outer space that are now used in all stealth aircraft. All stealth aircraft, for instance, all black jets, uh, what you're seeing of, of black helicopters and the like, uh, the skins and the coatings and the residues that are used predominantly in the in the aircraft themselves, in the airframes and the in the rotor blades and the fans and in some cases in submarines, uh, special titanium hulls, in the Phoenix class submarines now. Uh, all these come from all this has come from alien technology. 1947 is what the public has been told. Uh, something crashed in the backyard in New Mexico, a place called Roswell, New Mexico. Unfortunately, that's what the public's been told. The military's known about the alien question for the better part of 70 years, and they first saw their glimpse of what was going on as early as 1909 in the American Southwest. Now, Army cavalry evidently were chasing some bandits, and they entered this cave. They were holed up in a cave, and what they found in there was flying discs and and little gray guys and all kinds of weird things and they didn't know how to explain that and they wrote them down as best they could and it's been in secret archives ever since. That's up in the, this in the down by the Truth or Consequences uh, area of New Mexico. Well, the alien thing is more than just a what I'd call a non-visible threat. And we on the surface, first of all, all information dealing with alien or alien reproduced technology or alien reproduced vehicles or any other kinds of things well hidden from the American public. Our black budget, for instance, garners $1.023 trillion every two years. It's over $500 billion a year. Right now, there are 131 active deep underground military bases in the United States. There's 1,477 of them worldwide. Each one has an average cost of 17 to 19 billion dollars. Each one is uh, built in the site, uh, oh, it used to be, it'd take a year to two years to build each one, and now they're capable of building a couple of them a year uh, with sophisticated methods. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, Al Bielik has actually been on some of the high-speed railways, uh, the magneto-leviton trains that connect all the deep underground military bases within the United States. He's been on a Mach 2 train and floats off of, floats off of a single rail at a, a three-quarters of an inch off the rail and is uh, what you'd call high-tech. We have nothing like this on the surface. Uh, the public basically has been totally lied to. We're considered stupid or even moronic in some cases. Uh, it's got to stop. If, if we're going to gain our country back, we must, and I repeat, must, regain, we must instill in our public officials, anybody that goes and does public service, they must tell us the truth. If they cannot do this, then, then they must be impeached or they must, must be removed from office. If this cannot occur, if, if the truth cannot totally come out, the, the, I, there are reasons for secrecy, for instance, but if the truth cannot totally come out, uh, what's the use in us having anything called freedom? Okay, now I have pictures here that I'm going to show you during the break in artifacts. and I ask you to kind of look at them but not handle them. I have actual crashed retriever metal from Roswell, New Mexico. It's given to me when I was 14 years old. For instance, I've got other things. I've got pieces, 
pieces of titanium, this piece of titanium, a special titanium alloy made for everything from the original SR-71 Blackberry, that's old hat now, uh, F-117A is their old hat now. Uh, they're making a whole new class of hypersonic above Mach 5 aircraft that employ, they employ extremely modern charged particle beam weapons. They don't even use lasers anymore. Uh, computer enhanced imaging radar, although it's used in helicopters for public surveillance, computer enhanced imaging radar, and in satellite technology, uh, the brand new kit on the block is a, is a kind of infrared technology uh, where a, a satellite at 150,000 miles out in a geosynchronous orbit, or not quite geosynchronous orbit, but but these spy satellites can literally look in and see a dime on the floor, say on your kitchen floor. They have a resolution factor of 99.999961. Uh, this particular piece of metal, I'm going to drop it on the floor here, it'll kind of ring like a bell. You can't break it. Withstand temperatures in excess of 7,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It has niobium in it. It also has miranite in it, element 123. Yeah, please do. Uh, it's in a it's in a non-crystalline form. This is just kind of a dripping off of the out of the main crucible. Here's a crystalline example. It's in the scalenohedral crystalline form. We got this from the large grays uh, technology. Uh, this is grown in the confines of, of outer space, which has not quite a super vacuum, but uh, by the way, this is capable of withstanding temperatures in excess of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's great for uh, certain parts of aircraft. Uh, this kind of material I work with on a daily basis. After his testimony on deep underground military bases, the Greys, alien technology, alien agenda, and Dulce, New Mexico, Phil Schneider was assassinated a few months after his last speech. Philip Schneider's life certainly proved to be as controversial as his death. He was born on April 23, 1947 at Bethesda Navy Hospital. Phil's parents were Oscar and Sally Schneider. Oscar Schneider was a captain in the U.S. Navy, who worked in nuclear medicine, and helped design the first nuclear submarines. Captain Oscar Schneider was also part of Operation Crossroads which was responsible for testing nuclear weapons in the Pacific at Bikini Island. In one lecture taped in May 1995, Phil claimed that his father was also involved in the infamous Philadelphia experiment. Phil claimed to be an ex-government structural engineer, who was involved in building underground military bases all over the country, and to be one of the only three people to survive the 1979 incident, between the alien greys and U.S. military forces at the Dulce underground base. Philip Schneider had been on lecture tour for two years prior to his death, talking about government cover-ups, black projects and UFOs. In his lectures, he talked about the Greta Treaty. In 1979, Phil Schneider was employed by Morrison Knudsen, who had him building an addition to the deep underground base in Dulce, New Mexico. Four holes were drilled in the desert that were to be linked together with tunnels. Phil's job was to go down the holes, check for rock samples and recommend explosives to deal with a particular rock. During this process, the workers accidentally opened a large artificial cavern, that was a secret base for the Dahl Greys. Panic ensued that resulted in the death of 67 workers and military personnel. Phil was one of only three people to survive. Groom Lake is where the infamous Area 51 S4 S2, a CIA base, uh, uh, it was originally a bombing range, a nuclear test site. Uh, it was later become the most secret base in the United States. Um, it employs over 18,000 workers who work in shifts of 12 hours a, at a whack. Most of them work in the cover of darkness, like us. We built uh, nine underground military bases there, each with an average uh, uh, capacity capable was basically a city underground, roughly four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground. They have boring machines, for instance. They have boring machines, for instance. They don't bore. They literally vitrify and melt the rock, deflagrate the rock. It's a very sophisticated laser. Uh, 
uh, melting and deflagrating system. It reduces the rock to a powder and then melts the, the remaining rock as a coating on the inside of the base so you don't have to use gunite cements and other kinds of things like that. That's all, the, all old hat now. Uh, technology is so just basically the new technology we get is the old hat of the military. I'm going to be real brief about it. I carried a level one security clearance, the Rylite 38 factor. There are very few of us. There's nobody except myself, to my knowledge, talking like this. <clears throat> nobody. I'm breaking the law. I'm breaking world as well as federal law. I'm coming out and even talking about this to a group of people. I love my country more than I love my life. Two weeks ago, I was shot in the shoulder. I don't want to gore you women out, but I was shot in the shoulder up here. I recently have become friends of a, of a uh, retired FBI agent who took me under the wing. He says, I've never seen a person braver than you. And I said, well, there's more coming. Our patriot movement in these United States is going to pick up the ball, and we are going to kick the parasites out. First of all, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, a few other founding fathers, Patrick Henry to mention a few, all had visions that these United States is going to live 700 years from where they were standing, and that was uh, somewhere around the or turn, the late 1700s, early 1800s. So you can count this country. This country isn't going to go to a new world order. I believe firmly in constitutional law. I'm not very well skilled in it, and that's my embarrassment. But I'm going to be real blunt about it. The government that is now instilled in ruling over us, are ruling as we're serfs and they're the kings and queens. Now, that's a feudal system. That isn't even a democracy. We are now being ruled by an autocracy and a technocracy. In other words, technical knowledge is rules as king with a feudal type system. Feudal systems haven't been used in the last 350 years and they're coming back like gangbusters. If we are complacent, if we do not speak out in droves, and I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about a bunch of us getting together and getting on the stump and loving our country more than we love our lives, getting on, some of us are going to get killed. I almost got killed a couple of weeks ago. Hadn't been for a uh, hadn't been for an FBI, a retired FBI man, who risked his life, his career, everything, put it all on the line, and he didn't know me from Adam. A week prior to that, uh, he he re he listened to one of my tapes I gave up in Post Falls, Idaho, and I'm gonna be very blunt about. He mentioned he said that we need a lot more of you, but unfortunately we're not getting anybody. Well, I'm trying to, I'm not the best speaker in the world, but I'm trying to relay to you that we need to get out and seriously get the message out. These shows are great. This, this hall should be absolutely packed, standing room only, and we should be getting the message out to as many people as we can with as many shows as there are, is it possibly to reach. There are many is the public. We ought to get on talk shows, we've got to get on we've got to get on news shows and T V shows and we have to really get the message out. And I think we're doing it, but it's it's a little bit slow in the in the first part. That's that's just that part of the what I want to say. In working with the black projects, I was very loyal. I was picked because I was very strong mentally. There's a bunch of us that were picked because we don't crack under pressure. We don't freak under pressure, so to speak. Everyday events don't bother us. Now, I was involved in something very controversial, almost totally unbelievable to most of you, 
Some of you are religious people. I think all religions, all religions have a time and a place, and they definitely have a place in America. Now, another thing I want to reach to you is that during the unbelievable part, I was involved in building another base onto in inside of Dulce, New Mexico, which is Los Alamos laboratory. It's a biological laboratory. On the southwest part of the Archuleta Mesa, uh, we built an underground facility, a better part of three cubic miles hollowed out underground. Then to the southwest of that, we built, we were, we were in the process of the early stages of building, we drilled four large uh, tunnel-like holes. Some of them ran two and a half miles under the surface. A uh, number of the early, at that time, a number of the original uh, uh, wells or dr uh, drilling uh, machines that were used were, were um, uh, at the rate of uh, two miles a day. It was fairly rapid. The equipment kept coming up broken. So we wanted to go down and we wanted to send somebody down there, a human observer, or human observers in this case, to find out what was going on. Well, to our total surprise, first of all, the government knew all about it. They didn't tell anybody. Uh, when I saw Green Beret and Black Beret people encamped inside of our geologist camp, I knew something was up, the gig was up. First of all, I knew all about the alien agenda. I'll explain that in a few minutes. The large alien greys had been encamped there for as best as believed possible about four or five hundred years. It had been one of their internal bases. And we'd, we'd drilled holes right on top of it. All the stinking air, all the black sooty air came right out as soon as one the first hole was sunk and all this soot came up and, well, that's when it all, all the hell broke loose, really, all it started. Anyway, after we drilled all four holes, it took about a, two days to drill all four of them. And when you build an underground base, you drill four basic holes, and you build you know, called stopes or cross-member holes across, and then you bla use blasting equipment, you know, special blasting equipment by the analyzation of the rock formation, and you literally blast out or tunnel out or, or deflagrate or melt rock out to build the large rooms that are required for this underground base. Well, in this process, I was lowered down the basket of one of these holes, and about from me to this elderly woman here in the front was sitting a seven-foot-tall alien gray. The stench was worse than the worst garbage can you can imagine. Uh, the person was at, or the entity was absolutely horrible. I didn't waste any time or reach for my pistol. At that time, as an engineer, I didn't have time to carry all the fold or all of one of these big submachine guns that all the sea spray and the yellow fruit and the, all the uh, outer perimeter and inner perimeter security people carried. I carried a little Walter PPK pistol with a nine-shot clip. <clears throat> this was in August, late August of 1979. Now. You got a regular suit of clothes, you got a regular clothes on, plus you're in a almost like a spacesuit environment and you're reaching for a gun. It's it's not the easiest thing to do and then to pop a clip in it and start shooting. And I killed two of them. Yes, they're mortal and they do die. Phil claimed that scars on his chest were the result of being struck by an alien weapon that later resulted in cancer due to radiation. In 1987, Phil Schneider married Cynthia Marie Dreyer Simon. They met in June 1986 at a meeting of the Oregon Agaton Mineral Society. Cynthia mentioned years later that Phil, had so many interesting stories and so much information to share. Unfortunately, their marriage had difficulties. Cynthia claimed that Phil's health problems contributed to their breakup. Phil had multiple health concerns such as chronic lower back pain and multiple sclerosis. Occasionally, Phil had to use crutches, a body brace, leg braces, bladder bag, catheter, diapers and wheelchair. He also had osteoporosis and cancer in his arms as well as hundreds of shrapnel wounds, a plate in his head with a metal fragment in his brain, and fingers missing from his left hand. There was a scar that ran down from the top of his throat to below his belly button, and another scar that ran from under his ribs, side to side. 
Phil had numerous amazing stories, and one of his stories was his father's involvement with the Philadelphia experiment. When Phil's father died in 1993, he discovered original letters in his basement, that proved that the Philadelphia experiment actually happened. It also proved that Oscar Schneider had been a participant, after the crew members had been quarantined in Virginia Psychiatric Ward. Captain Schneider autopsied the bodies of the crew members, as they died and found alien implants in their arms, legs, behind their eyes and deep inside their brain. The implants had to have been alien in nature, and the small transistor, like item was discovered before transistors had been invented. Here was evidence that either by accident, or on purpose, aliens were involved with the Philadelphia experiment, and may have been responsible for its failure. Despite the fact that Phil's claims, seemed too wild or disturbing to be true to the average investigator, he believed in what he was saying. Phil claimed his life was in danger for revealing the truth. He borrowed a gun from his friend, Ron Utella, stating that he felt that he needed protection, because there had been several attempts on his life. For example, his car had been run off the road several times. Ultimately, Phil's safeguards weren't enough to keep himself alive. He was found dead on either January 10th or 11, 1996. Uh, one of them did this. I re all I remember is that he just kind of waved his hand in front of his chest, and the next thing I know, this blue beam hit me and just literally opened me up like a fish. And ever, uh, burnt, burnt my fingers right off of me, and it was some form of electrical force because the kind of like hit, being hit by a lightning bolt, burned all my toenails off of me, uh, completely crispy crittered my left foot, burnt the shoe right off of me. Um, all I remember was the smoking remains, and I'm laying almost, I'm still conscious, but in and out of, I didn't remember much. And there was a, a green beret that was right behind me that risked his life. In fact, he died. But he risked his life. He shoved me back in the bass and hit the button and took me up. And I wouldn't be alive talking to you today if it wasn't for him. I'm forever indebted. He lost his life. 66 Secret Service agents, Green Berets, Black Berets, crack troops lost their lives because the government, our United States government, lied, did not tell us anything about the alien threat. There's a war underneath there, and I'm d talking dead serious. It's been going on since that time. Since late August of 1979, our military, the Russian military, basically the militaries of the world, have been in constant conflict with the outer space alien. The, the small gray, the large gray, the reptilians, the whole thing. There are 11, there are 11 distinct races of aliens. Two are benevolent. One had to leave here in a hurry because their world is under attack, both on the surface as well as underground there, the Pleiadesians. They're familiar. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. Uh, would some of you raise your hands who've heard of Billy Meyer and uh, some of the, uh, oh, very good, about half the group. Well, Billy Meyer is one of these lucky people that they figured, well, he's kind of a simple type. We'll show him everything. Well, these are the benevolent aliens, and they've been here helping us. In fact, I have a picture. I have a picture. Let me reach for it here. I have a picture of one of the aliens been working for the United States Pentagon for the last 58 years. His name is Val, Val Valiant Thor. He's right here. There's my father in the background. This whole place, the ready room of the USS Eldridge, Al Bielica has probably explained, or maybe even shown you this picture. There's a list of the some of the notable people in it. They're all the atomic bomb scientists of the day, all the uh, time variant uh, experimentalists of the day, all the top physicists. Of, of that particular day. This was, in, this was in August of 1943. Now this guy has not changed one iota in 58 years. Started work, he came here, crashed here or whatever, whether he's under duress or not, he started work for our U.S. Navy and military operations in 1937, uh, either 37 or 38 is what I've been told. So it's for 58 years, this man's been employed probably under duress. If you don't do as we say, we're just going to 
use you for alien bait or something. I don't know. But anyway, he basically hasn't changed. He lives for 490 years, what he says his lifespan is. Now, he is supposedly a semi-benevolent, he's a human-looking type person. He has six fingers and six toes, and he's got one oversized heart, one lung, giant lung. Uh, his blood vessels are bigger. He's got copper oxide for blood similar to an octopus. Uh, his brain capacity 300 centimeters greater than ours. He has a thinking capacity, uh, IQ, if, it, if you were to measure it, be totally off the scale, be about a 1200 IQ. Um, he speaks 100 languages fluently, alien as well as others. Um, he's a remarkable person. I had a chance to meet him one time. Now, um, by the way, he doesn't shake hands. He was kind of in a spacesuit because all aliens, regardless of benevolent or otherwise, they're carrying germs and diseases and bacterium in and on them that are deadly to us. If I were making policy, I'd quarantine them all because, because how do we not know that some of our diseases like AIDS, Ebola, uh, hantavirus, and a few of these other weird designer diseases, as I call them, are not made from the cadavers of some of these aliens as a biological weapon to use against the people of the United States. Well, I'm tired. I'm a tired American speaking out. Now, now what I'm telling you is kind of a, almost like a brain overload here. Back in 1946, we set off a number, actually four atomic bomb tests at Bikini Atoll. It's a group of islands in the South Pacific. I have an original photograph here with the original language on the photograph that shows there is a large alien spaceship off a wingtip of the United States aircraft it was a drone aircraft right at the point where the bomb was beginning to show a neutron flash cloud. Here's the bomb going off. Here's the airplane tip here, and here is the alien spacecraft. Now, in 1947, excuse me, 1947, questions later, please. In 1947, after Roswell debacle, our military got before the U.S. Senate. They were hauled before the U.S. Senate and says, what's going on here? Well, we didn't know anything about disks until this happened. It flopped in our backyard. Total lie. They lied to the U.S. Senate. They should have been prosecuted as traitors. Anybody lying to a United States Senator or House of Representative, any Senator or House of Representative person, President of the United States, Vice President, any, any cabinet member, lying to the American public is a traitor and should be dealt with in an appropriate fashion. This is actual proof, positive, that this occurred in 1946. Now, the U.S. military knew all about flying disks and flying disk technology is early early as 1933. Of course, we remember the Germans did too, the Nazi Germans, Hitler and all, all their band, bunch of people. Now, it gets to the big question, if, if all this has been hidden from us, you know, everybody says, well, where's the proof? I've got some of the proof laying on the table. But a lot of you probably are totally skeptical. They say, well, I could be anything. In my hand here, I have a piece of what's called corbamite. It's the heaviest element in the world. Element 140. This piece of material weighs 15 ounces. It's three and a half times the weight of uranium. It cannot be made to emit gamma rays. It cannot be isotoped. It is totally stable. 
It is used in all stealth aircraft and all Phoenix-class submarines. When combined with other alien elements, it is impregnable. It cannot be melted with charged particle beam weapon. When properly combined in secretive compounds, it can withstand temperatures in excess of 10 million degrees Fahrenheit. It is grown by aliens who have given a good... The other side of the alien question is, some of these aliens have broken off from their mainstream and said, we're not getting a fair shake, and so this is what happens. And I'm talking about the alien graves. Some of them broken away. They're talk about not being popular. Well, this particular piece of metal is an amazing piece of technology. It's capable of being grown in 15 different crystal systems. Now, I'm a geologist, and I, prior to 15 or 20 years ago, knew of only six crystal systems. And there's actually 15, if you count all the alien metals. Now, this is only element 140. If you look at the local periodic table in your local library, it says 104. Somewhere down the line, we've been lied to, we've been cheated. What we have to do is we have to literally ask for the truth. If we cannot ask for the truth, we must demand the truth. We must take it before courts of law in common law systems, and we must demand it. If we cannot do this, our founding fathers told us the only thing left is to overthrow, to get the parasites out. I don't advocate overthrow, but it does look like this may be the only alternative. While examining Phil's body, Cynthia couldn't shake that something was off. Cynthia was soon contacted by Detective Randy Harris, who said that something was wrong because there were marks on Phil's neck. An autopsy report revealed that a rubber hose was tied around Phil's neck three times and then tied in a knot, which blocked blood flow to his head, resulting in him becoming unconscious and then dying. More surprising was that Cynthia discovered that Phil's lecture material, unknown metals, military photographs and all notes, for his unwritten book on UFOs were missing from his apartment. However, money and valuables remained untouched. And when he was found in his apartment, Phil's body was in an unusual position. His feet were under the bed, his head was in a wheelchair seat at an unusual angle, and the rest of his body was on the floor, hands by his side. Blood was found on the floor near his wheelchair but no blood was found on his wheelchair. No wounds were on his body to account for the blood. No suicide note was ever found. Mark Ruffiner, a longtime friend of Phil said, I saw Philip the weekend of January 6th and 7th 1996. We were going to buy land in Colorado. We were excited because he was going to hire me to help write a book about his knowledge on UFOs and aliens, the one world government, and the black budget. He did not commit suicide, he was murdered and it was made to look like a suicide. Phil's ex-wife believes he was murdered. She believes that Phil was met by someone he knew, and injected with a drug in order to incapacitate him. The assailants then wrapped a rubber hose around his neck, asphyxiating him. Several friends told Cynthia that they saw Phil with an unknown blonde-haired woman, few weeks before he died. Several people with psychic abilities, have indicated that Philip did not commit suicide, but was murdered. Now, I'm going to casually mention to you something that's very scary indeed and tell you what the alien agenda is. And it's going to sound very familiar. The alien agenda is the complete takeover of this planet, the killing off of five, six to seven eighths of the world's population by the year 2029. U.S. military has known about this for 45 years. They've told no one. As far as I know, I'm the only person standing before a crowd talking about the alien agenda, secretively. <clears throat> okay. They, back in 1954, I'll give you a quick overview. There was the created 1954 treaty where Eisenhower signed a pact with the known alien species of the time. There were three at the time. And said that we're going to deal in high technology, but you can take a few head of cattle and a few human beings and you can experiment on them. 
It's unthinkable. It's stuff straight out of the Nazi death camps, and I'm kidding you not, it's plain BS, and it's got to stop. Now, the great in 1954 treaty would have been violated. After, after the great firefight, the alien-human war, I am the only living survivor talking about it worldwide at all. Only one. The other two are in nursing homes in Canada, and the Canadian government refuses to allow any U.S. people, including myself, to talk to them because they are afraid of kidnap. Probably the reason I got shot to pieces and 11 attempts on my life is I am a direct threat to the entire system. The New World Order, the alien agenda is one in the same. It's world takeover and the decimation of the population of this planet. Now I'm going to tell you something a little bit different about the alien species. The bad news ones, there are nine races of alien populations. To look at a human being as a bag of food. They're not cannibals. They don't eat the flesh and the bones and all that kind of stuff. They use the glandular secretions of animals and human beings as a mixture of the vitamins for their food. They get high off of our adrenal gland substances called adrenal chrome. It's, a, it's something like uh, cocaine to them. Now, what can we do about it? We can, right now, if we do nothing, we can do nothing about it, and it will continue to go on. Basically, we'll be led in the dark, and you'll keep seeing more and more people disappear. Right now, there's 100,000 children totally unaccountable through FBI archives, cannot be traced anywhere. They haven't been murdered. Nobody's ever seen them. I think they're hauled underneath in some of these bases, and they are summarily done away with, and they are literally eaten. Now, that is a scary thing indeed. Some, and I'm not asking you to believe me in toto. I am asking you to seriously do enough homework that you can go out in through the public record, through the congressional records, find out who's voting for what, and go from there. Do your own program. Do your own agenda. And do your own speaking out. And if enough of us do this, there is some saving grace. However, we don't have a whole heap of time left. Technological governments on this planet are raping the planet. We're, we're going to run out of everything that we need. We're going to pollute everything in sight in the better part of 20 years. Now I know you've heard some poppycock stories. Oh, we're going to run out of coal. We're going to run out of gasoline. We're going to run out of this, that, and the other. And 25 and 30 year, years ago, you heard all this hogwash. Well, don't believe it. Basically, anything you read in a paper, you should take with a grain of salt. Start reading and what is missing out of the article. Ask yourself, what's missing in this article that I should know? Maybe that's the truth. Fill in the blank spots, so to speak. White copy is only one leg of the triangle. There are two other legs, two other pieces of the puzzle. What we have to do as a group of people, concerned people at that, and this group seems to be the, no, quite that, is we have to assert ourselves in a way that we've never thought possible. Now, I'm not asking you to do what I'm doing. I'm telling you, what I'm doing is very important. Every one of you is equally important. You wouldn't be in this room otherwise. You know, all these other people out here that didn't come to the lecture, they really don't want to hear it. I, uh, yesterday I heard a fellow who says, I'm sorry to say uh, I belong to uh, this military organization, that military, militant organization. I, I don't believe in the alien question. I, 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 there's no proof of it. And so I show him an artifact and he says, well that's nice. And, but that could be lead. Well, I happen to know this isn't lead. It scratches diamond and it's harder than that. Here's a sapphire that I found. When we blew a mountain apart, all these sapphires fell out. And sapphire has a hardness of nine right next to the hardness of a diamond. 
This thing scratches the heck out of it. Let's tear it apart. I'll tell you something. This technology is fine and dandy. At the risk of the human race, at the risk of one human life, it is totally worthless. We have to... The one beautiful thing about the United States of America is we value a human person's life. The minute we lose it, we are dead meat. It is... It is tantamount that we get back to constitutional law and for our officials not to believe in it or obey it. First of all, for a politician to say, well, I believe in the U.S. Constitution, but I believe in gun control. It can't be, you can't be a master of two houses. It don't work. What you must do is tell that politician, you are disobeying the Constitution of the United States that you're sworn to uphold and you are in treason territory, think about what you have said. You have 30 days to make that apology. If you do not make that apology, you are a treasonous individual and should be prosecuted. Now, there's a few other things I want to run by you, and they're kind of in rapid-fire order. Area 51 is only one base, one of the 131 bases. Of these 131 bases, I call Area 51 a mega base. It's got more than one base in it. It's Tonopah Test Range, Area 51, S2, S4, Groom Lake, and a host of others. Now, these mega bases are gobbling up our gross national product. Right now we're spending 28% of the gross national product on building underground bases solely. That doesn't count for the defense budget. That doesn't count for the spare parts budget. It doesn't count for any of that at all. And the black budget is dead, dead wrong. It sidesteps the United States Congress and its constitution of its people and says, you're a bunch of morons, you don't need to know. Well, a need-to-know basis is an executive order written during the Eisenhower era right after the created 1954 treaty and is treasonous and illegal in this country and should be overturned and abolished. <laughs> now, I believe in military preparedness, I believe in military secrecy to some extent. There's always going to be spies out there, and there are always going to be people that want, want your hunk of territory, your house, or your ground, maybe even a country like that. Yeah. Most of us remember what this crazy person in Russia, Jernovsky, had to say, we want Alaska back. Well, baby, you're not going to get Alaska back without a horrendous fight. Alaska is my land. I was born here in these United States. I have risked my life and limb for these United States, and I love my United States more than my life. And I will defend these United States against all foreign powers, foreign and domestic. Now, every one of you in this room are prob have probably, to some extent, minor or major, done just that. And that is what this country needs. Patriots you are, patriots you are becoming, patriots and constitution builders, you must continue to. Now, this is the way the world should be. There wouldn't be any wars, there wouldn't be any strife, or if there was, it could be settled in a peaceable manner in a handshake. And that's the original American way, and I believe that way is still there, however remote at present time. Now, 
I'm going to sum up this talk and mention an overview of the alien agenda. The alien agenda is completely decimate the planet to take the remaining human subjects as slaves and the aliens would use this planet for their own means. Number one, this cannot be allowed to happen. The world takeover plans of the New World Order, a direct carbon copy blueprint from Adolf Hitler's routine of 1933 to 1938 must not be allowed to happen. That includes the name the New World Order. That was purposely used, folks, because most of us have been lazy. We have not read our history, and I'm talking to you because I'm one of them. We have not read our history books. Things have been omitted. Throw out basically what you've learned. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to re-educate each one of yourselves and ask the unexpected of your public officials, of the people around you, your teachers. I'm not asking you to question authority. I'm asking you to question the teachers of this authority. Is this right? Is this law correct? If a law, one of the best statements to ever come out of the mouth of any human being, believe it or not, was, I think, by an incredible black man in the name of Jesse, not Jesse Jackson, but it was uh, Martin Luther King, excuse me, said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That should be a motto that we live by. Not so much for the man who said the motto, but I'm sure George Washington said something similar. Who said, an uninformed populace is a populace in slavery. Now, our founding fathers had the unique gift 250 odd years ago, 200 to 250 years ago, of looking far in advance, seeing, laying out the groundwork of this wonderful two, two pieces of paper government we've got, the Bill of Rights and the United States Constitution, laying it out for all time. It is the best government probably since time immemorial, maybe the best ever. If we are to, by the way, every freedom that we have must be fought for continuously. You don't need to pick up a gun to fight for something. You need to pick up your mouth. You need to pick up your brain and read a book. You need to pick up your mouth and say, and when you hear somebody say, well, I believe in gun control, and you say, no, I don't believe in gun control, because guess what? You take away that right. What other rights am I going to be missing later on? Now, with gun control. Gun control. There's a certain few people generally a one to two percent minority of people that are totally irresponsible, criminal, use a gun improperly, etc., etc. I'm not talking about those kind of people. There are always going to be those kind of people, at least for the foreseeable future. The average person that owns a gun has prudence, has conscious thought of the knowledge of right and wrong can and is able to defend itself, herself, himself, against foreign and domestic terrorists, so to speak. Now, gun control is an attack on your rights if it is allowed to fully comply and go through. All of your freedoms will be removed within a 10-year period after the last element of gun control. So the attack of any right or the removal of any existing right is an attack and affront on every one of us in this room and should not be tolerated. That's that part of the talk. The overview is about underground mountain bases. All of them should be made public. 
In future talks, I'll be giving latitudes and longitudes of every single one of these bases. I've already written a manuscript at the publisher as we speak. It's a dynamite book. It lists all the secretive agendas that our government has us believing in right now and why it's so much BS. Why the New World Order is so good for us. Ha ha. Well, don't believe it, folks. Believe in only one thing. Love thy neighbor as thyself and ask continually questions about our constitutional freedoms and defend them if necessary. And most of us will have to probably defend them. I hope this doesn't happen. Now, I'm winding up this talk as best as I can without my notes at hand, but I'll be having artifacts up here. You're capable, you're capable of looking at them. I ask you not to handle them. I want all the artifacts back on the table. And don't handle the photograph here, original photograph of the of the flying saucer in 1946. Now I'll take a, a certain few questions. I know there's going to be quite a few of them. Yes, this gentleman here in this row. I've heard of Project TARP. I don't really know that much. It's designed to uh, electrify the ionosphere, and they will be able to map all the underground bases. Uh, there was a crash of a uh, uh, Air Force uh, plane up in Alaska last week and uh, AWAC plane. Yeah. It was on the last day of a right. Project Harp uh, demonstration. Okay. Yes, I've heard of such projects. Uh, actually, it was invented by Nikola Tesla, the initial part of ionizing the atmosphere. The only trouble is with ionizing the atmosphere, plants, plants need nightfall as well as sunlight to survive. So lighting up the atmosphere might do extreme damage. Okay, next question. This gentleman up in the front row. Please speak up. Yeah, man, thank you uh, for taking the question. My question I'd like to ask is this. If the aliens have a 1,200 IQ, can speak all these languages and are so powerful, what prevents them from just taking over? Well, it's a good question. <clears throat> Basically, they have taken over. All that's left is a bunch of screaming, all a bunch of us that have been very complacent. Uh, half of the 131 under, deep underground military bases are basic cities for them. Right underneath our feet is a macabre site indeed. You can bet your bottom dollar they've already basically won the war. However, they're being an alien species. We are an alien species to them, and our germs have a tendency to kill them. <clears throat> they're also a dying race, and they're in far worse condition than anybody with the worst case of terminal cancer. They are in need of us to some degree. I heard a man speaking about the same things you have been speaking about down in Australia named Stan Dio. Do you know that man? Stan Dio? Yes, I've heard of him, but I don't know of him. Are you aware of this asteroid headed toward the Earth? It's yes, really Nemesis is uh, called Nemesis. It's a brown star. It's probably hollow. It's maybe not a star at all. It has a specific gravity of a little less than two, one point. 718 or something like that, which means it's extremely hollow and light. It has a mass of 10 times the size of Jupiter. It is so massive, it's dragging comets and, and meteoritic material with it and space garbage and debris. It's dragging it at such a rate. Just the debris encircling our solar system enough to destroy half the planets of it. So, yeah, it'll be a threat. It's headed for us right now. Supposedly it'll be here in 2052. Nobody knows for certain, or it'll be within closeness of the Earth, within 500 million miles, which is plenty close indeed. <clears throat> okay, a few more questions. I got to wrap it up here. This this lady here. No, 
You have to use the microphone. Nobody can hear you. Do you correlate the foreign forces with uh, the Soviets? Uh, the Soviet forces, the foreign forces, uh, all of us have an alien war going on. Red Chinese right now are getting it in full brunt. The Russians are shooting down per province. There are about nine provinces in their motherland. Uh, they're shooting down at the rate of 50 of these saucers per month and ships. They're heaping piles of them in outer Mongolia, mountains of them. They just tow them out there and let them sit out there. Yeah. You please use the microphone. Nobody can hear you. Does the uh, alien agenda dictate the agenda of the, go of the world globalists right now, the people that want world government? Are yes, they do in, the, in, in total and in entirety. Are, and are they some, may even be in charge. And are some of our uh, uh, high-level officials, perhaps from the president on down, are they aware of this? Yes, they are. They're all aware of it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What is the name of your book and when will it be out? Well, I have several several names of the book. Basically, I'm calling myself Government Secrets Revealed, Government Secrets Revealed, and uh, please don't handle a picture. I've asked, please, not to you look at the artifacts, but don't handle them. Okay. And the Government Secrets Revealed should be out within two to three weeks at the outset. Yes, sir. Where can you get get this book? Where will uh, it be at? I'll have it. I'll have it in a brochure. I can't tell you right now. Uh, yes, sir. The person behind you, and then the person behind that, and that'll be the. Okay, uh, Phil. Question. I want to say thank you and God bless you for what you're doing. It takes a big man like you to do it, man. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to uh, emphasize here, I'll make it real quick, is that uh, can what can we as humanoids do to? Uh, we're not humanoids, we're humans. Humans, all right. Well, anyway, what can we do to uh, stop this? By doing exactly what we're doing right now. I mean, gathering? We're gathering, listening, and what I'm doing, getting out in the public and talking about it. Okay, uh, also, don't, I, I don't fear ridicule. If someone wants to call me a brand X nut, hmm, well, I can't reach that person. I'm sorry for him. Yeah. Uh, I'm well aware of what's going on with the Area 51, and uh, I know that uh, we're capable of going into the future right now and coming back. Can you please use the microphone, or is the microphone going dead down there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm well aware that our country is capable of going into the future right now and coming back through uh, uh, the, uh, the Please technology. make this short. What is your question, sir? Uh, what? How far? Can we go into uh, knowing what's happening with the aliens in Area 51? How far? I mean, how far can we get into the knowledge of this? We're already full-fledged into the knowledge of this right now. How far can we go? We can go a lot further. Uh, we have to defeat the alien threat. Otherwise, we have no chance at all. There won't be a new world order either. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Let's take this last gentleman here. Did the United States government? Uh, intentionally enter into an agreement with the aliens back in 1940 uh, well let's 1954 see, I guess 1954 is, yes is they intentionally the they knew full well what their capacity was they intentionally did so supposedly on the premise that they were buying time to get arranged and this wasn't true this was a lie dished out to the public and the people in the know at the time uh, all the MJ members, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it did buy time, but at great cost. As we speak, as I'm speaking, rather, uh, about six million to seven million human beings have been slaughtered by the aliens at present time, unaccounted for. And of course, there's a, a thousand lies to say where they went or where they didn't go. Okay. I'm telling you right now that the lies and innuendo not only have to stop, if we don't believe in them anymore, they're going to right. stop, guaranteed. One, okay. one final question. Um, the the so-called ascension movement... You know nothing of, of it. Is, I don't mix You know the, nothing of it. Nothing of okay. it. Okay. 
Thanks. Can't hear you. Cannot hear you. 